अरुणाचल शिव अरुणाचल शिव अरुणाचल शिव अरुणाचल अरुणाचल शिव अरुणाचल शिव अरुणाचल शिव अरुणाचल के निम्बम जन पिड़ को अरुणाचल अरुणाचल शिव अरुणाचल शिव अरुणाचल शिव अरुणाचल अरुणाचल शिव अरुणाचल शिव अरुणाचल शिव अरुणाचल नमस्कार Uh, that was Sadhuam singing uh, b- verse ten of Sri Aranat Chakram Malay, which is the verse I'm going to be talking about today. Um, what Bhagavan says in this verse is, "Ain in the urakum ene pira iruka idu vuna karaho Aranatchala." The basic meaning of that is Aranatchala, why this sleep when others are dragging me? Is this beauty for you? If we, but the implied meaning is, uh, Arunachala, why this pretended sleep? Seeing what is happening to me, but remaining unconcerned as if you did not see it, like one who is asleep, when others who have no right over me, namely the Shaya Vasanas, which rise as likes, dislikes, desires, fears, and so on, are dragging, attracting, or luring me outwards, away from you, my rightful Lord. Is this beauty, uh, in other words, befitting or becoming uh, for you? Um, in the previous verse, what Bhagavan said is, "Ene yari tipo dene kalava vidil iduvo an mayaranachala." That means arunachala. Um, na- But that is slightly expanded meaning. Now, implying now that I'm willing to surrender myself entirely to you, if you do not unite me with yourself in inseparable oneness, thereby destroying me, is this your manliness? Um, so, as he implied in that verse, uh, like a young girl who has entrusted herself wholly to the care of her beloved, Bhagavan has surrendered himself entirely to our natural. So he is now waiting expectantly for Arunachala to dis- destroy him now at this very moment, thereby making him one with himself. If instead of doing so, Arunachala ignores his prayers, is that manliness? Worse still, if he allows others to drag his devotee away from him, does it befit him? Um, that's the implication in this verse, um, this present verse. If a if a man is present when others drag his lover away from him, he must either be lacking in manliness or asleep. Since Arunachal is ever present, shining eternally in the heart of all jivas as their own fundamental awareness, I am. How can it be appropriate for him to allow others to drag his devotee away from him? Does he lack manliness? No, it cannot be because his manliness is his aral shakti, the power of his grace, which is his very nature. Uh, then he must be asleep when others are, uh, drag his devotee away from him. But how can he ever be asleep? Oscillating between waking, dream, and sleep is the nature of the mind. But our natural is the fundamental awareness I am, which shines constantly in all three states. Without ever undergoing any change whatsoever, so he is eternally awake and ever untouched by sleep. If he seems to be sleeping, therefore, his sleep is only a pretended sleep. So, if he pretends to sleep when others are dragging his devotee away from him, does this befit him? This is what Bhagavan implies in this verse. Um, Just to go through the, the meaning of a verse word by word, "ain" is an interrogative uh, adverb that means why. "Inda" is a demonstrative adjective that means this, and "urukum" is a noun that means sleep. So "ain" in the urukum means why they sleep. Uh, "Ene" uh, is, is the accusative singular form of a first-person pronoun, so it means me. 
pira is a noun that means other things, and pira, with an with R at the end, is a plural personal form of it. So it means others, particularly in the sense of outsiders, strangers, or aliens. In other words, those who do not belong to one and to whom one does not belong. Uh, irka uh, is the infinitive form of a verb iru, which, iru, which means to pull, drag, uh, attract, draw to oneself, suck in, swallow, engulf, uh, influence, coax, or persuade. And as is frequently the case in Tamil, the infinitive is used here to express a condition in the sense of when. So, ene pira iruka uh, uh, means when others are dragging me. Therefore, the first sentence of this verse, ein in the urukum, ene pira iruka, uh, means why they sleep when others are dragging me. And then the, the next uh, sentence, Idu, the first word is idu, it's a demonstrative pronoun that means uh, this. Unaku mean, is the dative form of the second person singular pronoun, so it means to you or for you. And araho is an interrogative form of arahu, which means beauty. So araho means, is it beauty? Therefore, idu unaku araho means, uh, uh, literally means, is this beauty for you? thereby implying, is this befitting you or does this become you? That is, when others are dragging the mind of his devotee outwards, away from the heart in which he is residing, does it befit him to remain unconcerned without doing anything to protect his devotee as if he were asleep? In this context, Pira, others, implies Vishaya Vasanas, which are egos, Vasanas, uh, to seek happiness, ego's inclinations. Uh, inclination, uh, vasanas means inclination. So, uh, Vishaya Vasanas are ego's inclinations to seek happiness in Vishayas. Vishayas means objects or phenomena, namely anything other than, uh, than ourself. Um, though Vishaya Vasanas belong to ourself as ego, they are alien to ourself as we actually are as we will recognize with increasing clarity, the more we turn within and thereby surrender ourselves to our own actual, who is ourself as we actually are. That is, so long as we are constantly rushing outwards, believing that happiness can be obtained from things other than ourself, we willingly allow ourselves to be swayed by our Vishaya Vasanas as if they were our friends and quite natural to us. But the more we surrender ourselves by turning within and clinging to our nature in our heart, the more clearly we will recognize that they are neither our friends nor natural to us, but are actually just thieves whose nature is to deceive us and thereby rob us of the infinite happiness that is our own real nature, as Bhagavan implies in the next verse, namely verse 11. What he says in that verse is, Ain bula kalva ahatilni pohumbo dahatilni ileo aranachala. That means, aranachala, when the five sense thieves enter the heart, are you not in the heart? The five sense thieves here um, implies the, the Vishaya Vasanas, which are the seeds that sprout as desires for the pleasures that are seemingly derived from the five kinds of sense objects. So when they enter my heart, um, to steal my attention away from you, are you not in my heart? When, such is the case, when, you, when you are in my heart, why do you not protect me from them? This is why in this 10th verse, Bhagavan describes these thieves as Pira, others. Uh, since he has surrendered himself wholly to Aranachala, he belongs only to him. So since the nature of Vishaya Vasanas is to draw, drag the mind outwards, away from Aranachala, they are thieves, stealing from Aranachala what rightfully belongs to him. Therefore, it is his natural duty to protect his devotees by not allowing them to be dragged outwards by any Vishaya Vasanas whatsoever. <clears throat> Therefore, when Vishaya Vasanas are constantly rising, and trying to pull our attention away from our natural, 
who exists and shines eternally in our heart as I am, why is he pretending to sleep as if he does not care about what is happening to us? Uh, as we saw above, his sleep cannot be real because his very nature is to be eternally awake. Uh, awake. So it can only be a pretended sleep, which is why Bhagavan refers to it as in the urakom, this sleep thereby implying indirectly that it is not a, a real sleep, but just a pretense. Um, since Aranatra can never really sleep, why does it seem to us uh, that he is sleeping, as if he did not care in the least about our being dragged away from him by our Vishaya Vasanas? <clears throat> Though he is eternally awake, He's the infinite space of pure silence, so he is ever motionless, Achala, and hence, in our view, he seems to be asleep. However, his aral sail, the action of his grace, is exceedingly subtle because it's his very nature, which is pure motionless being. So the fact that he seems to be doing nothing does not mean that he is actually doing nothing. He is doing all that is necessary to protect us and help us to turn back within, but he is doing it without doing anything. That is, his grace, or Arul, is the infinite love that he has for us as himself, because he never sees us as anything other than himself. Since love is, so, so since love is the supreme power, there can never be any power that is greater than his grace. Since infinite love is what he actually is, it is his very nature, his being. So he and his grace are one and inseparable. Since grace is his being, its nature is not to do anything, but just to be as it is. However, by just being as it is, it does everything that needs to be done. As Bhagavan implied in the 13th paragraph of Nana, when he said, Sakala uh, Karyangalayam or Oru Parameshwara Shakti Nadati Kondirakira Padial. That means since one Parameshwara Shakti, Parameshwara Shakti means uh, uh, Ishwara uh, means God. It also it means God is the ruler. So Param Parama Ishwara Shakti means the supreme ruling power or the power of God. Since that one Parameshwara Shakti is driving all karyas, karyas here implies whatever needs or ought to be done or to happen. So everything that needs to happen or everything that needs to be done is being driven by him. Um, and in the, again, in the 15th paragraph, he says, uh, uh, Sangalpa Rahitarai Irakum, Isan Sanidana Visesha Matratal Nadakum Mutoril Aladu Panchakritian Gul. What that means is this is just part of the sentence. Mutoril is a Tamil word that refers to the three functions of God, the threefold functions of God, uh, namely creation, sustenance, and dissolution of the world. And panchakritiya is a, a, a Sanskrit term that means these basic three functions, creation, sustenance, and dissolution, plus concealment and grace. So in other words, all divine functions. Uh, and then Bhagavan says, which happen merely by, uh, uh, but which happen by merely the special nature of the presence of God who is Sankalpa Rahita, one who is devoid of any desire, volition, or intention. So what Bhagavan underlines, in, in, firstly, in the 13th paragraph, he said that the power of that one divine power, that one power of God, Parameshwara Shakti, is driving everything. So whatever needs to happen, whatever ought to happen, both in the material world and internally, everything is being driven by him. But how is he driving everything? He's doing it without doing anything. It's by the mere special nature of, of his presence. Um, <clears throat> so because he does not see us as anything other than himself, his love for us is not only infinite, but also perfectly pure. 
pure love doesn't uh, need not do anything because its nature is to attract everything to itself. So by just being itself, it draws us unfailingly to itself. And thereby it does everything that needs to be done without actually doing anything at all. That is, by just being as it is, it not only sows in our heart the seed of love for itself, but also nurtures that seed until it grows so great that it swallows us in itself as itself. This state of just being as it is, is what Bhagavan described in that portion of the 15th paragraph of Nana as Isan Sanidana Visesha Matram. Matram means uh, merely just or nothing more than. Uh, Sanidana Visesham means the special nature Oh, oh, the special nature of the presence of Eason, Eason, God, Eason Sanidana means the presence of God. Visesha means the special nature of the presence of God. Uh, because what is called the presence of God, Eason Sanidanam, is his mere being, which is what is always shining eternally in our heart as I am. Um, however, Though he is doing all that needs to be done by merely being as he is, he will never force us to turn within against his, our will. Therefore, his grace works through us, making us willing to turn within, but we have to cooperate with it by yielding ourselves to it, which we can do most effectively and completely by patiently and persistently trying our best to turn within to see what we actually are as he implied by saying, eninum guru kartya varipadi tavarada nadaka vendam. That means, nevertheless, it is necessary to walk unfailingly in accordance with the path that Guru has shown. That is what Bhagavan says in the final sentence of the 12th paragraph of Nana. What he says in that paragraph, I won't read the Tamil now, I'll just read the English meaning, he, that's a short paragraph, but a very, very important paragraph, a very great assurance Bhagavan gives. He says, God and Guru are in truth not different. Just as what has been caught in the jaws of a tiger will not return, so those who have been not returned means once we've been caught in the jaws of a tiger, there's no escape. That's what it is implied by will not return. That implies will not escape. Uh, so those who have been caught in the look or glance of Guru's grace will never be forsaken, but will surely be saved by him. So this is a very great assurance Bhagavan gives. And what he means by caught in the look of Guru's grace, it's not talking about the physical look of his eyes, but the very fact that we've been drawn to him, we've been attracted to him, means that we've been caught in the look of his grace. So his grace has fallen upon us and drawn us to him. So we will sure we will he will never forsake us and he will we will surely be saved by him. But then he adds this important um this important uh, 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 caveat. Nevertheless it is necessary to walk unfailingly in accordance with the path that Guru has shown. That is Though Guru will do everything, we need to cooperate. If we don't want him to destroy us, he will not destroy us. And we show our willingness to be destroyed by him by turning within. Because by turning within, by holding on to self-attentiveness, we are giving up everything. This is what Bhagavan um, makes clear in verse 26 of Uludunapadu, for example. In What he says in verse 26 of Uludunapadu is... Um uh, If ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. What he means by those two senses, everything means everything other than our real nature. All other things appear, seem to exist only in the view of ego. So it's only when ego, when we rise as ego, but other things seem to exist. When we don't rise as ego, nothing else seems to exist at all. And then he says in the next third sentence of that verse, Ahandaya Yavamam, 
ego itself is everything. That is just when we are dreaming, for example, the whole dream world, everything we see in that dream world, we are seeing ourselves as the dream world. But that is the mind is, is seeing itself as a dream world. So the, the dream world, everything that appears in the view of ego, does not exist independent of ego. So it derives its semi existence from ego. That's why Bhagavan says, ego itself is everything. It is that which appears as all this. And then in the final sentence of that verse 26, he says, Adalal, therefore, Yadu Idu Endru Nadale, Ovadal Yabamen Or. Therefore, investigating what this is, this him refers to ego, investigating what this ego is, is giving up everything. Why is it giving up everything? Because uh, the nature of ego is to rise, stand, and flourish by grasping things other than itself. That means by attending to things other than itself. That is the food on which ego uh, uh, flourishes. So that one implied in verse 25 of Uludhanapadu, the previous verse. But if ego, instead of grasping anything other than itself, tries to grasp itself alone, its nature is to subside and dissolve back into its source. So investigating what this ego is, brings about the dissolution of ego and the, to be, or the, the subsidence and eventual dissolution of ego. To the extent that ego subsides, everything else subsides because everything else depends for its semi existence only upon ego. So by investigating ourselves, we are surrendering ego and thereby we are sur- giving up everything. So um, that willingness must be there on our part. That's why Bhagavan says it's necessary for us to walk unfailingly on this uh, path. Um, However, though it's necessary for us to walk unfailingly in accordance with the path that Bhagavan has shown us, namely the path of self-investigation, which is the culmination of the path of self-surrender, we cannot do so without his help. So when we find ourselves being dragged outside by our Vishaya Vasanas, and cannot find in ourselves sufficient strength of bibaka, clear discrimination, judgment, or discernment, bhakti, love, and vairagya, uh, dispassion or freedom from desire, when we don't have, when we don't find in ourselves sufficient strength of bibaka, bhakti, and vairagya to cling fast to self-attentiveness, it is necessary for us to cry out to him in prayer, as he has shown us in this verse. Why this sleep when others are dragging me? Is this beauty for you, Arunachala? Um, so this is the, that is in these verses of Akshamlai, Bhagavan is, treat, is teaching us how we, what we should pray for and how we should pray for it. That is what we should pray for is only the, that it ultimately our ultimate aim is only the dissolution of ego. So long as we are allowing ourselves to be pulled outwards by our Vishaya Vasanas, we are thereby nourishing and sustaining ego. So we, we have to pray to him when we don't have the strength to resist being pulled outwards by our Vishaya Vasanas, we need to pray to him with such heart melting love, but Bhagavan. Uh, exemplifies for us in this beautiful love song. Um, so, uh, of course, when Bhagavan was singing Aksharam Lai, he was already established in, I mean, his ego had already been annihilated. So there was no need for him to, uh, to, to sing this for himself. He sang this for our benefit. So that we could learn that, that is, he is showing us the way the way that he went, the way the, the means by which he attained uh, that uh, dissolution of ego was by such heart melting love for Arunachala. And that heart melting love that he had for Arunachala, that he is the previous he before he was annihilated by Arunachala, the heart melting love that he had for Arunachala matured his mind, gave him a, the love to look within more and more and more. So eventually, when that intense fear of, of death arose in his heart, a bit, when he was a 16-year-old boy in Madurai, that intense fear of death 
prompted him to turn within one final time. And that time he turned within so intensely, but he was swallowed by Aranatra, swallowed completely. So this is, of course, was sung by uh, some, um, that was in 1896. This is uh, about 1912, he sang Aksharam, right? So that's uh, after about 16 years. Um, so he's not, these prayers are not prayers for himself. He is, that is, through through the body and mind that we call Bhagavan Ramana, Arunachala, who is the reality of, of Bhagavan Ramana, who is what Bhagavan Ramana actually is, Arunachala is teaching us how to pray uh, for our annihilation, how we can we can also be annihilated as um, the, the ego that was aware of itself as I am Venkataraman was annihilated. Um, there is also another implication that Bhagavan alludes to in this verse. This is less direct implication, but we can see this implication underlying this. That is, so long as we remain awake to our real nature, nothing can pull us out of that uh, state. But as soon as we rise as ego, forgetting our real nature, we fall a prey to Vishaya Vasanas, which drag our attention outwards. This state in which we seem to have forgotten our real nature is the sleep of self-ignorance, otherwise called maya, or more specifically, avarana shakti, the power of veiling, which is the first and most fundamental of the two powers of maya. The other power of maya is vikshepa shakti, the power of scattering, dispersion, or dissipation, which is the effect of uh, avarana. Whereas avarana is what rises as ego, the false awareness I am this body, because ego is what obscures and veils the real nature of our self as pure awareness I am, vikshepa is what rises as ego's vishaya vasanas, under whose sway its attention is constantly being scattered outwards, giving rise to the appearance of all vishayas. Uh, vishayas means objects or phenomena. That is, um, Maya is always said to consist of two powers. The fundamental power is this Abharana Shakti, the power of veiling. That is, the power of veiling means the power of veiling our real nature. So what is it that real, veils our real nature? It is ego. But ego is the false awareness, I am this body, that it obscures the real nature of ourself as I am, as the pure I am. So ego is the avarana shakti, and ego is vishaya vasanas. It's it's inclination to uh, to um, to attend to, to to seek happiness in other things and therefore to attend to other things. They are what is called vikshepa shakti, the power of dissipation or scattering. Um, so um, without forgetting our real nature, we could not rise as ego. And without rising as ego, we could not fall a prey to Vishaya Vasanas. So our varana is the fundamental sleep in which the entire dream of samsara takes place. The dreamer of this dream is ourself as ego. And this dream consists of many dreams, in each of which we dream ourselves to be a different person. So the entire life of each successive person that we mistake ourselves to be is just one of the many dreams that constitute this long dream called samsara. In order to put an end to this dream of samsara, we need to awaken from the sleep in which it occurs. And since this sleep is just the sleep of self-ignorance, avidya or ajnana, we can awaken from it only by being aware of ourselves as we actually are. What we actually are is pure awareness, which is what is called vidya or jnana. And pure awareness means awareness that is aware of nothing other than itself, I am. So it can never be self-ignorance, since what is self-ignorant, so, and hence what is self-ignorant is only our self as ego. That is our real nature, is the pure awareness I am, which can never not know itself. So the, the self-ignorance is, is only our self as ego. What we actually are is pure vidya. The ego is avidya. 
um, vidya means knowledge or in this knowledge in the sense of pure awareness. Avidya means ignorance in the sense of self ignorance. Um, uh, since ego is what is always aware of itself as I am this body, self ignorance is its very nature. So, as Bhagavan pointed out, what is called avidya or ajnana is nothing but ego itself. Therefore, awakening from the sleep of self-ignorance is what is otherwise called the destruction of ego. That is, since ego is the false adjunct conflated awareness, I am this body, when we as ego turn our attention back within so keenly that we cease to be aware of anything other than our, our own being, I am, we will thereby cease to be ego and remain as we always actually are namely as the real awareness I am, devoid of all adjuncts. Therefore, if we wish to awaken from the sleep of self-ignorance and the consequent dream of samsara, the only means is to patiently and persistently try to be as keenly and constantly self-attentive as possible until we finally succeed in being so keenly self-attentive that we thereby cease to know or to be anything other than the one fundamental awareness I am, which is what we always actually are. Right? Um, therefore, if we view this work verse from this perspective, we can interpret the term indo urakum, this sleep, as referring to ego's sleep of self-ignorance rather than to any seeming sleep of Arunachala. Um, well, the main meaning it's referring to a sleep of our natural. This is a, 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 a underlying implication that is a, an alternative meaning, which is in, indirectly implied. Uh, if we take it in this sense, ein inda urakum ene pira iruka iduvuna karaho arunachala. Why this sleep when others are dragging me? It is beautiful arunachala. If we in this, if we take it in this sense, what it implies is. Why do you still allow me to remain in this sleep of self-ignorance when you know that in this state, others, namely Vishaya Vasanas, will be constantly dragging me ever further away from you, my real nature? Is this befitting you? Is this beauty for you? Or is this befitting you, Arunachala? So long as we are lost in this sleep of self-ignorance and therefore dreaming this dream of samsara, we are so deluded that we will have no love to know and to be what we actually are until Arunachala shows so until Arunachala sows the seed of such love in our heart. Therefore, it is his responsibility to sow this seed in our heart, and having sown it, it is his responsibility to nurture it until it becomes so all-consuming that we are finally willing to surrender ourselves wholly to him. We do, of course, need to cooperate with him by trying our best to be self-attentive as much as we can. But the primary responsibility is his, because he is Jnana Swarupa, the one whose very nature is pure awareness. So he alone is the light of knowledge that can remove the darkness of our ignorance. Therefore, when the devotees, devotee whose love is fully ripe Praise to him, as Bhagavan prayed in the previous verse, praise to him with a melting heart. Arunachala, destroying me now, if you do not unite me with yourself in inseparable oneness, is this your manliness? If he does not destroy her immediately, but instead allows her to remain in the sleep of self-ignorance, in which she is dreaming that others are dragging her away from her, him, her beloved, does this befit him? Om Namo Bhagavate Sri Arana Chalaramanaya